I'm going to share a message with you this morning that I've entitled More Than a Handful. Say that with me, say more than a handful. Let's stand together. I'm going to be reading from the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 15. It says, And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not, and let fall, uh, fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley, or a, or a bushel of barley grain. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Open up our spiritual eyes and ears. Let us receive from heaven. In your holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. You can be seated once again. Thank you for being here. If you haven't already done so, check in. Let people know you're at church this morning. Let them know you're in church, at church. Amen. That you don't just have to watch it online. Of course, we let our folks know that if they feel like they can't come to church, we don't want anyone to get sick. And if you feel like you need to stay home, you can watch the services online. But we encourage you to come out as well. It seems like it's good for people to get out and uh, get outdoors, you know, and breathe a little bit. You, you don't have to wear the mask all the time. I want you to be healthy, but uh, we're starting to hear more things that say, uh, you know, it's nice to breathe some fresh air for a little while. Amen. We're reading here a, a story about Ruth, a beautiful story and a lesson that's, that God has given us about somebody who was a stranger in a foreign land. Ruth was defeated by all appearances, outward appearances, but her Redeemer saves her and lifts her up and restores her life. It's a picture for you and I, or you and me, of what Jesus has done for the world, a, a, a story of love and, and trust, and not giving up on our Redeemer, if you will. Ruth was uh, from a place called Moab. The word Moab actually means Mother, father. Mo is, stands for mother. Ab stands for father. Moab meant from my mother's father. In other words, the children of Moab were born out of an incestual relationship. The word Moab kind of uh, insinuated sin, if you will. So it was saying that Ruth was born in sin, like we all have been. Amen. We all have been born in sin, <clears throat> and we're strangers in a foreign land. And this is what Ruth is Showing us here. Ruth, like all of us, is, was born in sin. And, and here comes a time in her life where her husband dies. She's living with her mother-in-law, who also had lost her husband. There are two widow women who have very little means of support. But God puts a thought in her mind that if she goes to the unemployment office, if she goes to the welfare department, that he will bless her there. Somebody's going to bless her there. Now, I want you to understand the, the welfare program in this day was not like our welfare program. Uh, today, if somebody goes on welfare, sometimes they don't have to do anything and they just get paid. I think they're told to look for a job. And as long as they're looking for a job, they keep, keep getting paid. In this day, what the welfare program was is that if you didn't have means to support yourself, then you could go work in a field harder than everyone else to get half of what everyone else is getting. You work harder to get less, but at least you got a source of income. And what that welfare program did is it made people want to get off welfare as soon as possible. Hello. I remember when I, uh, years ago, I had lost a job, and um, so I applied for unemployment, and uh, they said, of course, you know, you look for a job, and I did, and, and, and I found a job, and the job paid me $1 a week more than my unemployment check. In other words, I could work 50 hours a week and make $1 more than I made if I just took my unemployment check. And they told me, you don't have to take that job. I said, I'm going to take the job. And they said, but why? I said, because I can. I said, I don't need a handout if I can work. Hello. And so I took the job. But I, but I didn't stay there. See, one of the things that um, unemployment can do to people, which is, is, is harmful, is it can make them happy. <laughs> And see, if you're happy with good, then you'll never, you'll never go for better or best. See, a lot of times people will settle for good when what God wants for you is best. Hello. We should never be satisfied with enough when God wants you to have more than enough. Amen. Enough and to spare. 
And so she goes to glean in a field. Now, let me explain what gleaning means. I grew up on a farm and we, we grew all kinds of crops like corn and watermelons and uh, radishes. And I can't remember all the things we grew, all kinds of stuff. But um, the, uh, to glean is, is when you'd hire the, the, the harvesters to come in and they'd pick the, the fruit or the, you know, whatever it was. If it was corn, they'd go pick the corn. If it was watermelons, they'd go pick the watermelons uh, from the vines. They'd go down every row and the trailer would go down. They'd pick them up and throw them up there. And then when they were finished harvesting uh, the, 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 the crop, there was always like a smaller watermelon or one that maybe hadn't grown quite enough or one that maybe one of the harvesters missed. There was always those kind of things down the, the rows. And they would let the poor people come in and glean. And that's what that meant. You get the leftovers. If there was a watermelon that had a little rotten spot on it, they wouldn't take that for harvest. They, they couldn't sell that one. But it still had some good watermelon to it. And if you, if you were getting it for free and you needed something to eat, well, you'd be happy to find that. You just cut off the rotten part and you eat the rest, you know. And so that, that's what the gleaners would do is they'd have to work harder because they had to travel a lot further to get a little bit of fruit. And, uh, and what they got wasn't as good as the other stuff. So they had to work twice as hard to get about half as much as the other folks. But that's what they would do. They, they would glean the field and, and the farmers would let them do that. And it says here in Ruth 2, verse 3, that she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. The reapers go first, and then they, they follow after them. And her hap, or in other words, it just so happened that she lighted on a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was a, a relative. He was a kindred of Elimelech, her father-in-law. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then Boaz said to his servant that was set over the reapers, who, who's that girl? <laughs> Whose damsel is this? See, this wasn't a big city like Houston. It's a smaller town. And Boaz knew most of the single girls in town. He was a single man. And he sees this girl that she don't look like the other girls. She looked like she's from out of town. Okay. And she's gleaning the field. And he just happened to be there when she was gleaning. I like the way that Ruth says that. It just, I just happened to be there when the owner of the field showed up. And I just happened to be in the part of the field where he happened to be. And he just so happened he saw me and he asked the guy, hey, who's that girl over there? And I want you to know something. It didn't just happen by chance. I know that's what it says. It was a coincidence. It just happened to, to take place. But I want to tell you something. God was in this. Amen. I admire Ruth for saying it just happened because she was saying, I didn't set it up. I, I, I didn't plan this. I just stumbled on it. I didn't even know it was coming. And let me tell you something. When good things happen to you, don't get puffed up. Don't think that good things are happening to you because, you know, you're smarter than everybody else. Good things happen to you because you're better looking than everybody else. <laughs> Hello. Good things happen to you because God has blessed you. You got to remember that without God, you can do nothing. Amen. And God wants to bless you. God loves you. He loved you before you even knew there was a God. Amen. God has loved you and he's had his eye on you. If it wasn't for the Lord, you'd have nothing. James chapter 1 verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. It's God who blesses us. The reason our nation is blessed, as I said earlier, isn't because of the Democrats or the Republicans, but it's because God blessed America. Amen. And there's a reason that God blesses us. God says he doesn't do anything without a reason. God didn't bless you so you could have more bling. He didn't bless you so that you could brag about what you have. God blessed you so you could be a blessing to others. Amen. So you could be a reflection of his love and of his light to the world. Amen. God bless you so that you can bless those that are less fortunate than you are. So you can have compassion on them and pray for them. You ought to realize that there, but by the grace of God, go I. Amen. Ruth was wise enough to know that this wasn't her doing. She just happened to be there. She didn't know how to explain it. She knew she couldn't make it happen again. She had no control over it. But God's love for you didn't just happen. God loves you because he chose to love you. God loves you because God is love. Amen. And God loves you not in light of who you are, but in spite of who you are. Amen. You didn't earn his love. He just loves you because he chose to love you. Amen. And so Ruth finds herself 
being blessed. She's gleaning in the field and things just seem to be going her way. In Ruth 2.15 it says, And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. Well, what does that mean? Well, like I said, if you're going to harvest, in, in this case it was barley or it's like wheat, what you'd go in and you'd, you'd cut the wheat. And you'd gather the, the sheaves, the stalks. And you'd bring them in and you'd shake them down. But when the harvesters go, boy, there's not much wheat left. And the gleaners would have to go in and, and try to find out what maybe fell down on the ground when they cut the, the, the wheat. Some that fell or maybe a, a little branch or two that they missed, they'd, they'd cut that. And when, when the harvesters would go in and maybe uh, down one row, they'd get a bushel full. The gleaners would have to come in. They'd probably have to go down five or six rows to try to get a bushel full. But Boaz told his uh, harvesters, he said, hey, guys, let her go in the field behind you. And, and don't, don't get the, 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 the wheat, you know, just cut some of it and let it fall down on purpose. She'll think she just got lucky and got a whole big, you know, sheath full of, of wheat. But let her just get lucky. And, uh, and don't cut it all. Just cut a little bit and leave a lot for her. Make them think you're the worst harvester there is, you know. But leave a bunch for her on purpose. That's what he says. He said, let her glean even among the sheaves. And reproach her not, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. Don't get on to her about it, let, just leave her alone. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah full of barley. So she went out and worked, and, and, uh, and she worked hard all evening. And when she was done, she had an entire bushel full of the grains. You know, the, the, the wheat's about this tall, and you, you cut it, and then you take it into the, the barn, wherever they're, and they beat it out, and they get the seeds out. And one big uh, sheave full of wheat may just be, a, you know, a few cups of grain, or maybe a quart of grain. I don't know. It's, but it's not a lot. And so they have to go out there, and they have to work a lot and bring a lot in, in to get an entire bushel full of grain. But she did. She went out there, and she worked hard. And she got an entire bushel full and brought that in. And these harvesters, you know, they were paid by how much they picked. And so they were good. They, they didn't leave much, you know, when, when the others came in to glean a harvest. But boy, she was blessed. Boaz told the hands, let her pick among the sheaves. In other words, don't just give her leftovers. Let her, let her get the good stocks and pretend that you drop some and let her get those on purpose. Amen. And what usually takes all day to get a half a basket full, she was able to get a full bushel. And she was excited because of the blessing of God. And she did this throughout the end of the harvest. She kept going in and just getting blessed. Everything kept going her way. Amen. Why? Because God's hand was upon her. Because she followed Naomi to this place where they would be a relative. The word Naomi means God's grace. She followed God's grace. Friends, there's, you know, there's no better God, uh, advice I could give you than that. Follow God's grace. Amen. Follow the word of God. Do what God tells you to do and you'll get the results that God says you're going to get. In Ruth 2 verse 23, it says she kept a fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and, and, and the wheat harvest. And she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Man, Ruth was excited about her blessing, but this was a potential problem because if she wasn't careful, she could get happy with this and say, I'm going to glean the rest of my life. I'm going to stay on welfare. It seems to be going my way. But welfare was never meant to be a permanent answer. Amen? Don't, don't get accustomed to a handout when God wants to give you a hand up. Amen? She was gleaning in the field, but God wanted her to own the field. Hello? I want to tell you something. It's okay to be blessed. There used to be an old uh, commercial, the Frito Bandito. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, Lay's Potato Chips made this commercial about Fritos. And the Frito Bandito would, uh, would walk up to somebody that had Fritos and said, it's better to give than to receive. And they said, yes, you're right. He said, didn't give. He pulled a gun out, didn't give, you know. <laughs> but, but what he said was true. It's better to give than to receive. And what, he, what, what, what that saying means is that it's nice to receive a blessing. I had somebody come to me one time. They said, hey, pastor. I said, yeah. And they, they threw something to me, and, and I caught it. And, and what it was was the keys to his Jaguar, black Jaguar. I said, what's this? He said, that's your car. 
I said, man, you can't give me your car. He said, I can do whatever I want. I said, are you serious? He goes, yeah, that's your car. I had a couple of vehicles given to me. And I want to tell you, that's a blessing. Amen. Now, I got to tell you, when, as a pastor, when I was driving around that black Jaguar, I had all kinds of people criticize me. Well, who's he think he is driving that black Jag? And I know that any one of them, if they'd have caught them keys, they'd have taken it too. Hello. Amen. They'd have been praised the Lord. But because I took it and I was a pastor, they, they, they criticized me for it. It's so silly. But it's a blessing to get a car, isn't it? If somebody came to you today and gave you a car, boy, wouldn't that be a blessing? But I'll tell you something. It's even better to be able to give the car away, isn't it? To be blessed so much that you can give out cars to people. It's great to be a professional athlete, get a multi-million dollar paycheck. Woo! It's even better to be the guy writing the checks. Who can hire people like that? See, it's, it's more blessed to be able to give than to receive. Receiving is good. We've got to be careful, though. If we get on that welfare check, if we get on that uh, enough, we might get satisfied with that when God wants us to have more than enough. Good can sometimes keep us from getting better or best. See, the title of the message is more than a handful. I mean, she was going down the field and she was getting handfuls on purpose. They were blessing her, but God wanted her to own the field. He didn't want her to just be settled with a handful. He wanted her to have more than a handful. Amen. Someone say more than a handful. If we're not careful, we can become satisfied with enough when God wants us to have more than enough. We can get content with free milk and cheese from the government when God wants you to own Procter & Gamble. Hello. You know, I know some people have been blessed because somebody gave them a job or gave them a car, but we want you to be blessed and, and be able to give the things away and be a blessing. Amen. I want you to be blessed so much that you can be a blessing. Don't be satisfied with a free handout or a free handful when God can give you a hand up. Amen. Someone say more than a handful. God wants you to have enough and to spare. God wants you to be blessed to be a blessing. He doesn't want you to just have enough. He wants you to have more than enough. Ruth was out there gleaning with, with the other poor folks in town that were unfortunate. And she was blessed by God and but God wanted her to have more than that. God wanted her to own the field. So instead of just getting a handful, she'd be the one giving the handfuls out. Amen. He wanted her to have more than a handful. Thank goodness that she followed God's grace. She followed Naomi. And then in Ruth chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he went with barley at night in the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And when he lies down, that you mark the place where he shall lie. And you go lay and uncover his feet, and then lay down, and he'll tell thee what you should do. Now, this was the custom of the people. When, when a young maiden wanted to marry this gentleman, she would go lay next to him and uncover his feet. And this would let him know when he woke up, she, she would like for me to marry her. But it was more than that. See, he was a relative and, and they had a law that, you know, if, if a widow, if, if a woman's husband died, that the next of kin should marry that widow and not leave her as a widow, but take care of her, take responsibility. But sometimes the guy didn't want to do that. And actually, in this case, th there was actually a closer relative and uh, he didn't want the responsibility. And Boaz didn't want him to have the responsibility. Boaz wanted to marry this. He liked this girl. Amen. And when he realized that, that she was willing to marry him, he decided to marry her. And it's like the Cinderella story. That field that she was working in, that field that she was gleaning in, gathering up uh, a poor widow's portion, now she would own the field. It's like the Cinderella story. You remember Cinderella? She was, they called her the cinder girl, the Cinderella, because she was cleaning out the fireplaces. She was a servant. But when she married the prince, now all of her debts belonged to the prince. And all of his wealth belonged to her. And all of her enemies were now the enemies of the king, the prince. And all of his power was her power. Amen. And this is how it was with Ruth, just like the Cinderella story. When she married Boaz, now that field she was working in was her field. Amen. Now the one giving out the blessing was her. Amen. You know, it's good to have enough, but God wants you to have more than enough. Amen. It's good to have joy, but God wants you to be filled with joy. Amen. 
God wants you to have it pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God doesn't want you to just have joy, but he wants you to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen? He wants you to have divine health. He wants you to be happy. He wants to be a friend that's closer than a brother. He wants to, you to walk with him and talk with him. Amen? He wants to have fellowship with you. God has so much for you. Amen? R Ruth was telling, or Naomi was telling Ruth, I'm glad that this has been a blessing to you, but God wants something better for you. And before it was all done, Ruth owned the field. Amen. She didn't want to, Ruth to just get crumbs from the master's table, but she wanted to be able to sit at the master's table. Amen. God rained manna down from heaven, and it was a blessing, but it was a temporary blessing. Amen. It was never meant to be permanent. It was designed to get you out of the wilderness and strengthen you for the difficult time, but to get you to your promise. Amen. Welfare, welfare is designed to get you on your feet until you can get strong again and get to the place where you can have more than enough. Some want to keep getting a handful or a handout, but God wants to give you a hand up. Ruth was blessed off the scraps of others, but thank God she didn't get satisfied and she wanted more than a handful. She ended up marrying Boaz and becoming the owner of the field. Thank God Naomi helped Ruth to catch a vision. Naomi was saying, Ruth, you're gleaning in a field that God wants you to own. You're gleaning behind employees that God wants working for you. Wow. He wants this to be yours. It might have been difficult for Ruth to, to catch that vision, but it happened. When she came, became the bride of Boaz, then she owned all that he had. 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says this, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Let me tell you something, everything on this earth belongs to God. Everything on the earth, everything above the earth, everything beneath the earth, it all belongs to God. And when you accept Jesus as Lord, now you're an heir and a joint heir with Jesus. That means you have authority over all as well. When he's Lord of your life. It's like the Cinderella story. And the problem is a lot of people don't think they deserve it. Oh, I don't think I could ever do that. I don't think I could ever have that. So they, they live a defeated life. I mean, Ruth was a foreign girl in a foreign land. She was single because her, her husband had passed away. She was a widow. She probably thought, no one's going to want me. She lost her sister-in-law, and now it's just her and her poor mother-in-law. She, she maybe couldn't see herself wealthy. She had never been wealthy in her life. Maybe she had a difficult time catching that vision. Maybe she never owned anything. But I want to tell you something, the tallest mountains are right on the other side of the deepest valleys, amen? The biggest buildings downtown are the ones that have the deepest girders, amen? If you think that life has taken you low, maybe God is just preparing you to take you to some high places, amen? Don't get satisfied with a handout. Don't get, get satisfied with a handful, because God wants to give you a hand up and God wants to bless you, amen? And give you enough and to spare, more than enough. I want you to have more than a handful, I want you to be blessed and not cursed, above and not beneath, riding and not walking, the head and not the tail. And you know when you get that blessing? When you invite the, the landowner, when you invite the, the king to be your groom, amen. When you invite Jesus to be Lord of your life. Let's stand together. Naomi told Ruth, this is what I want you to do. And you know what Ruth said? She said, uh, all that you tell me to do, I'll do. God's grace told her, hey, do this, Ruth. Do these things and God's going to bless you. And she said, whatever you tell me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And if we would do what Jesus tells us to do, then we would have what Jesus says we can have. Amen? And Jesus says he wants you to be an heir and a joint heir with him. He wants you to be blessed and not cursed, above and not beneath, the head and not the tail. Amen. So right now we're going to pray and then in a few minutes we're going to receive our tithes and offering. But I just want to know right now as you're standing, is there anyone here that would say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to invite Jesus to be Lord of my life. I want him to be my bridegroom. I want him to be my savior. I'm tired of going through difficult times. If that's you, just lift up your hand right where you are. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Pastor, pray for me. I want to pray for you. Maybe you feel like you've been gleaning in the fields and you've been working extra hard just to get by and you're tired of that. Pastor, pray for me. I want God to bless me. Thank you. Yes. 
Who else? Pastor, pray for me. Maybe you, you want us to pray for you. You can call us. Call the number on your screen. We'll pray with, with you. Amen. Listen, you're not alone. You may be here today and say, Pastor, I've been having a difficult time. I've been trying hard, working hard, but I feel like I'm just spinning my wheels, not getting anywhere. God wants you to be above and not beneath, blessed and not cursed. Anyone else, if that's you, say, Pastor, pray for me. Just lift up your hand. I want to pray with you. Thank you. I hope the message ministered to you. Listen, I want to encourage you to invite Jesus to be Lord of your life. If you haven't done that already, do that now. All you got to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash them away with your blood. I accept you as my Savior and Lord. And I make a vow to serve you, Jesus, as Lord of my life for the rest of my life. If you prayed that prayer with me, if you believe it in your heart, you confess with your mouth, you're saved. Amen. And I want to ask you if you would consider sowing a financial seed into the ministry. That It's simple to do. All you got to do is text any amount to the number on your screen, 940-241-4450. That number again is 940-241-4450. You can text any amount to that number. Or if you'd like, you can go on our web uh, site, clc-church.com. That's clc-church.com. And on the menu bar, the word, you'll see the word give. Click on the button that says give. A menu will drop down, and you can give through PayPal that way. Or if you'd like to mail an offering in, you can do that. Our mailing address is 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas. And the zip is 77. Three three nine. That's eight zero six Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas. Zip is seven seven three three nine. Of course, my favorite way for you to give is to come into the church and fellowship with us. We just want to get to meet you and love you and uh, pray with you, and we hope to see you here soon. Come out and visit us, Christian Life Center here in Kingwood, Texas. Once again, thanks for watching. God bless you.